How many gifted subs gets us gifted three? I know I said I'm burnt out after an episode. You know, I could go for this the next episode. Why not? Why not? Let's let's hop right into it. I want to see where this goes because I feel like this episode taught us a lot, but that it also left me with a lot more questions. Yeah, we're going to do it. I don't have the brain rot right now. I'm feeling refreshed and awake and uh, analytically sound. And before I'm not happy with episode three reaction, it has to redo it. <laughs> it's, we'll see. But the simping rejuvenates and heals my brain. So I want to do it. I want to dive into uh, episode three here. Yes, we're really watching episode three. And let's start it off by saying hi to YouTube. Hello, YouTube. And welcome to the continuation of a show that I have failed to see any dip in quality yet. We are, we are barreling straight on through, um, you know, from the second episode and trying to pull out as much as we can from what we're seeing. I've called this a flawless series for now. This is true. I think that the characters are so flawlessly handled and interwoven with the plot and the and the exposition and the narrative and the world building that I have yet to see any part of it dissuade me from that. And I'm eager, I'm, I'm actually looking for it now where I'm like, how can this be so good? Like, where is the crack going to be? Wh where, where am I going to find a moment where, where the show loses my trust in it? Because it does happen, but I've yet to see it happen. Many speculate the crack might be this episode. We will find out. Or, or, will, I, or will I try to justify a way to protect my um, enjoyment of the show by dismissing it? <laughs> I guess that's what we're going to find out. So let's continue. What is the purpose of a, of a scene like this? This is such a deliberately inconspicuous opening shot. Yes, it's a button. I, I, this show has, has told me that every single piece of it is relevant and, and that the composition of the scenes themselves are meaningful. Cat. Oh my god. Oh my god. What was that? Is he eating what I think he's eating? That looks like tomato to me. This is a bannable offense, this show. <laughs> I love this soundtrack as well. It's just, it's trying to play that up. Like, <laughs> everything is fine. <laughs> そういや、ちょっと時間かかりすぎかも。つまり水浴び、ただいま河原は<笑><笑> <laughs> it looks. We may yearn for each other, but before that, we are comrades. Oh, I like this. I like that they're giving the other characters also some characterization, right? Shall we bring up the hierarchy? Shall we do it? Let's get theoretical here for a second. I'm about to dissect the psychological complexity of a scene where characters talk about potentially peeking on uh, their anime girlfriends or uh, wishful girlfriends. Yeah, I'm going to break out the hierarchy here. Okay, let's talk hierarchy of needs. We'll, uh, we'll keep the trauma cam in focus here. 
So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We've we've seen this all before. I'm sure you have, e either on my show or Ed's show or just around the internet. But I'm going to bring some some context to this. So so Maslow's whole idea about psychological development was was that we have this hierarchy, this this list of priorities that we need to sort of satisfy before we can feel psychologically sound, right? And it starts off with physiological needs, like you, you basically just your survival needs being met. You know, air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and reproduction, right? So their air needs are definitely met. They they can definitely breathe where they are. Their water and food and shelter and sleep and clothing needs are basically met as well. And they are in a in a position here where they're they're psychologically sound enough that they can actually think about the idea of reproduction, right? That they that they're able to invite the emotional requirements to be attracted to people. Because you will often see this actually, you know, with people who are not having a lot of their basic needs met, that their libido is extremely restricted, right? If someone is depressed, they're not going to be very interested in having a lot of intercourse. And and you can even see this in in relationships as things break down as well. Like, you know, people lose interest in connecting romantically with each other when they don't feel satisfied in other areas of life. You're not able to tap into the psychological or physiological desire to reproduce or to at least have intercourse because there are other needs not being met, right? It could likely be the esteem needs or the love and belonging needs that aren't being satisfied and, and they deny you the emotional requirement that makes you lust. So it's actually telling us quite a lot that these characters are able to still tap into that emotional requirement, that they could still find each other, you know, attractive and and still want that, that social interaction. It basically tells us that a lot of their other needs are met despite being in this very horrific sort of situation, right? Because what it also tells us, because as we go up, right, we have safety needs, which are personal security, employment, resources, health, property. I would say that a lot of the people on the 86 don't have many of these things. They don't have a strong sense of personal security, right? They're at war. This 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 category is is easily not being met. Employment, sure. I mean, this is like their job basically, but it's not like it's it's not like it's a a worthwhile satisfying career. It doesn't have the same purpose that someone like Lena who is an operator has that even outside of what she's doing to protect the country, this is also a career for her. There's a personal growth that's happening alongside it. I don't know if that's necessarily the same for our characters on the 86 because of exactly what Lena was asking Shin at the last episode, which was when you finish your consignment, what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do with your life in terms of employment, resources, health, and property, right? Their health is obviously at stake because they're at fucking war. Love and belonging, right? Their their sense of friendship, intimacy, family, and sense of connection. This is also able to be considered with where they are right now, right? A sense of friendship is definitely intact. They're able to make fun of each other. They're making fun of their friend here for, you know, still being interested in Anju. They're able to conceive of the idea of intimacy, even in this very horrible situation. They have a sense of family, you know, they have camaraderie and they have a sense of connection. They, this, this part of their hierarchy is very psychologically sound right now. Their esteem is definitely in question because they are literally considered inhuman and that has to have effects on their self-esteem. Their, their sense of respect, esteem, status, recognition, strength, and freedom. I think inside their own culture, they have a lot of esteem, like they respect one another, they feel themselves confident and competent in their roles, and and there is a sense of freedom, you know, when they're out on the farm or whatever like this. But in the bigger scheme of things, they're, they're definitely restricted here. And Maslow's idea was that only when all of these needs are met can you self-actualize. Now, it is not necessarily the case that the hierarchy needs to be resolved like one, two, three, four, five, like that you need, you know, that you can't, you can't satisfy your love and belonging unless your physiological needs are met. You can tap into a sense of esteem, even if your safety needs are not met. So it is not just a linear, like sort of progression in terms of you need one before the other, right?
if I were someone who was doing therapy for for someone on the 86th, I would be considering this to say, what does this person need to self-actualize? And to self-actualize mean, means to become the most that one can be. That does not mean becoming a perfect person. It means doing the most you can as a person with the resources and life circumstance that you're stuck with. And so my process of therapy would be like, how, how do we satisfy the needs that are not being met, right? And the esteem needs are definitely a big part of that. How do we make you feel like your life is still valuable and that you are respected when the world tells you the opposite of that? Well, I would say we can't look for esteem in the world context because the 85 countries or, or states in the, in the Republic will never acknowledge you right now. So let's look for esteem in something else. Let's look to confirm your esteem through love and belonging. Let's find you a girlfriend, basically. Right. This is the approach I would take. I, I would genuinely say we're we're not going to get safety and esteem needs met by external forces like the world or your culture. Those things are out of your control. What is in your control is can you find someone that makes you feel respected, that makes you feel secure, that gives you a sense of property, finds you a girl who owns you, right? <laughs> No, but seriously, that I, I, I'm I'm memeing on it a little bit. But yes, I would tell these people as their therapist, find a way to get those needs met. Get a girlfriend, right? Try to maintain a sense of intimacy and romance and and connection, right? Through through um whether it's just intercourse or or just going on dates or something, because we want you to be the most you can be given these life circumstances. Maybe they can rent a girlfriend. Yeah. So this, I swear to God, even even a scene like this, which is just a kind of like funny, lighthearted scene about anime characters falling after anime girls, I still think there is a, a psychological subject to unpack in the context of where they're living and what their lives are like and what I would do to help someone like this. And I actually think that they're in a healthy state of mind to pursue each other in a romantic sense what happened to not getting attached to each other i mean they should get attached to each other lena i mean theoretically shouldn't get attached to them because it's dangerous for her but i want her to i mean we may yearn for each other but before that we are comrades yeah he, he's even trying to prioritize that my relationship to her starts at a practical domain, right? That that we're loyal comrades. And only only when that's okay can I start to visit the idea that I'm also pretty attracted to her. Tomato pause. I know. I know. It's gross. It's sickening. Yeah. <laughs> anime moment this show is perfect yeah this is very reserved like overall they're all basically wearing all of their clothes is it really okay to be having fun out here by ourselves? Yeah, I, I, they're checking their own hierarchy and asking, like, are we safe enough? Are all of our needs met enough that I can invite psychologically the idea of having fun, which is a, an essential component to mental health as well? It's so interesting, this this uh, this kind of scene. <laughs> そういうとこに悪いかいあるのよね。ブログ。表情内調も。ごめんね、気が回らなくて。あんたもシンも当番ないんだから、後日作って2人にしてあげればよかったわよね。Hey yo. That's what she likes about him. You can never tell what he's thinking. He's a mystery. He's a mystery boy.
she's having um reaction formation <laughs> reaction formation is um when you express the opposite of what you feel because of you know an insecurity or um a sense of embarrassment or whatever it is you know this is the classic like the little boy who bullies the girl he likes because to to invite the real emotions makes him feel uncomfortable because she they don't know what to do with them and and that's exactly what she's feeling right here is that reaction formation asundere yeah i mean i guess i guess that's what that is i don't know i don't know the anime term i know the psychology term but i also see uh three shadowy figures in the corner here <laughs> I, I can see them i can see them down here in the in the corner there the, that the boys are watching yeah i guess i guess that's what a sundere is explained psychologically it's just reaction formation <laughs> Uh, and all they and they show up to watch the girls, and they're only talking about Shin. <laughs> That's gonna be embarrassing. Oh my gosh. These girls are sinister. <laughs> well, they're having fun. That's the other thing is I, I do think that such a contrast to Lena's world where everyone around her, she has no way to connect with, right? And and you can tell the marker of someone you're connected to by the fact that they can mess with you a little bit like this, right? In in a respecting way. They're they're messing with her because they all know she likes Shin. And they're not doing it. They're not going too far to where they're trying to embarrass her. They're trying to invite her softer side and, and have a little bit of levity by sort of goading her into fawning after him. This shows a strong, strong connection between all of them. It means that they know a lot about each other and that they know where's the line. Like, where can I push that's still safe and makes this person feel comfortable and respected? And yes, exactly what you're saying, Tebow. They're also trying to encourage her. By saying, "Oh well, if you're not interested, I guess I'll go, I'll go try to scoop him up. So you better, you better go quickly, you know." So they're also being very supportive of her, and that's the that's the complete opposite of Lena's world, where no one supports her, no one gets her. She's completely locked off from everyone, and and she basically only has Annette to, as I said in the first episode, to sort of bait out the real Lena, the one who's like not so guarded and not so locked in. And she does that with giving her um, access to real food. Here, this this redhead character's friends are able to bait out a more locked-in emotional side to her by kind of messing with her her sense of romance a little bit. So it's it's very heartwarming. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Keep an eye on you too. <laughs> ダイヤ。今までありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。あり
I know they said that going down to the river would be like heaven, but I think this is it. <laughs> a bunch of um, quite stern looking women with firearms about to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> The justifications. <laughs> So as I was talking about them all having a very good read on each other, what are we learning though? That despite they have enough social connection and, and enough of their sort of hierarchy of needs being balanced out that they know how to draw out genuine emotions from each other, they don't have this for Shin. They have the wrong read of him because what I talked about in the last episode is that there's the perspective of him that he's sort of locked in emotionally, but that he's really not, right? In fact, I think he's probably the most sensitive to difficult emotions out of all of his peers. In some ways, it's his own reaction formation, right? Like he's he expresses the opposite of what he feels and what he feels is grief and trauma and regret and a burdening sense of responsibility that he is happy to take on so that no one else can right like shin is basically the person at the center of all of this that lets everyone else have their hierarchy of needs be balanced because he's willing to say my physiological needs are met but my sense of belonging and esteem and self-respect have to be unturned so that everyone else's can be managed properly. They are afforded time away from the battle and away from the military operations to have fun, to connect with one another, to be engaged in ideas of romance and belonging and um, to mess with each other in a way that he's not able to. And the fact that he sacrifices his ability to engage with that registers as someone who's detached, locked in, and, and isn't expressive at all. But it's the complete opposite. He's so good at showing them that. One, probably because he doesn't want to get attached to them and he doesn't want them to attach to him. But two, I think he's he's not aware that it's not healthy to be so so in denial of that full range of emotions. But in some ways, right, he experiences the same thing Lena does because she's forced to be on her own because no one agrees with her and no one will take the perspective that that she has shin is also alone because he's he's sort of choosing to he's he's giving up his sense of um belonging and self-esteem so that they can have theirs but what that leaves them with is is a distortion about who he is that he's he's no fun at all i bet shin is a very fun person to hang around with and i can't wait till the moment that lena arrives on the 86 side which i'm sure will happen at some point and is able to draw out the fun side of Shin that none of his other people are able to. Because I think he's he's good enough at keeping himself from vulnerability around them. But he's not going to be able to do this with Lena because I think he's just going to simp too hard for her. I think she could break down anyone's um, cold, hard exterior. <laughs> and Shin's not ready for that. <laughs> this is great as well. I, I love the motion of this scene and, and the way it's escalating like their emotions, right? Because it goes from, oh, we're upset at you to now we're all in on the joke to also back to, yeah, what the fuck did you want to ask us, right? It's handling our view of the characters extremely well from a writing perspective. What do I think Shin would draw out of Lena, if anything? I think Shin already is drawing out from Lena the side of her that she also denies, right? She keeps up a whole a cold, hard exterior because she knows that letting people in doesn't work, right? 
they don't identify with her sense of morality, that these these are real humans and that they suffer in the same way that we in the 85 uh, colonies do. So she doesn't show that very often. She doesn't partake in the fiction and in the propaganda that the rest of the world does, but she doesn't try to fight it that often either. We only saw one scene so far where she tried to fight it, where she's in the classroom and she does try to elucidate the class on what's really going on. But this is rare for her. Most of the time she locks herself off from like the real Lena, the one that has her plushies in her house, the one that enjoys a good, genuine um, meal of real food, the one that she lets Annette, who's probably the only person who really gets her see. And so what I think Shin will probably draw out from Lena is more of that genuine emotional side, right? And that willingness to be a little more vulnerable. And as we also saw in, in the battle scene from episode two, he's also able to draw out her sense of self-esteem, right? There was that moment where he's like, look, I don't need you to tell me where the enemy is. And in fact, you're, you're making my job harder because they can tell where we are when you talk to me. And she had that moment of like, oh, sorry, you know, like I'm, I'm not doing a good job. But then he was like, okay, but I need you to tell me this. And she perked up, right? He's also able to draw from her those reinforcements to her self-esteem. And I think that in some ways, they're both a little psychologically locked off and, and can draw out some of those more um, internally repressed emotions. Just as we saw at the end of the last episode where we saw like... Lena's genuine interest in Shin as a person, not just as the undertaker, not just as a very astute and operationally competent soldier, but as a person. She's probably the first person to ever engage with him on that level of asking him, what do you want to do after all of this is over? And in fact, engaging him with the idea that he will actually be alive when all of this is over, which is probably not something that a lot of these kids think about because that's exactly what shin said he's i never thought about it because they all assume that they're not going to make it through this and here you have someone like lena actually asking them and not disqualifying the idea that they will live through this and she is going to be the person who helps them live through this and i will care about you every step of the way and here's the thing that you probably don't know is that i will still care about you after we finish this all of that is what got Shin to smile in a way that I don't think any of his peers have ever seen before. And this conversation they're having right now uh, exemplifies that. They very rarely see him crack from that. And, and only Lane was able to do it. I think she's, she's challenging their ideas of, of what comes next. She's opening the idea that the narrative of being a soldier who is destined to die and repeat this cycle is is changeable and if that narrative's changeable you are changeable your personal narrative is changeable and you can you can become a different person than the world tells you you have to be i i'm sailing on that ship as well masha tank i i i'm leagues away from the shore on that ship <laughs> what i also find fascinating about this show is how much it can bring analysis to characters who are not even on the fucking screen like, we're learning so much about two characters and their dynamic. They're not even in the scene. Like, they're, Lena's not even in discussion in this scene. She's like, she's not even been um, talked about in this episode, basically. Like, uh, they're talking about Shin and, and their reflections on him makes us draw out reflection on him and Lena in a way that, like, is just masterful. I have yet to see a show so complete and just like excellent at, at drawing so much from stuff that's not even taking place on the scene. Like we're watching what someone might look at and say, oh, this is a tropey like anime bath scene. It is not a tropey anime. Okay, it is actually, it is that, but it's also so much more. <laughs> I point out a lot of detail and provide perspective I hadn't considered especially the psychological perspective. Yeah, uh, no, no doubt. Uh, this, this is what we do on this show. We spend way too much time analyzing single frames and single lines of dialogue from a psychological perspective. And that's why it takes me two hours to watch a 20-minute episode. <laughs> so yeah, 
Let's continue. Otherwise, we'll be here forever. <laughs> and even at the end of this, she's able to register that this is just gentle, um, sort of playful uh, dialogue. Like she's not genuinely upset by that. This is such a, a healthy group of people. I'm rat. Interesting. So this Oh no. Now we're getting now we're getting um some romantic conflict here. And what are you doing to forward that relationship, Kurena, right? This is a... Uh, what this is called is displacement. Displacement is a very common uh, cognitive distortion. I've talked a little bit about displacement before, but it's this idea that we harbor an emotional challenge that has a specific target, but the actual target of that emotion is unsafe for us, right? So right now, Korena is very frustrated at herself for not having the initiative and the romantic confidence to tell Shin how she feels about him, right? So she is the target of her own frustration and anger. However, to choose herself as a target feels unsafe because that would drastically lower her self-esteem and confirm the idea that she's not able to to muster the confidence right and so she displaces that anger to a safer target a different target in this case shin and also lena without realizing that she's doing it right and this is extremely common in relationship dynamics and is one of the most common kind of communication breakdowns that you'll find especially in couples counseling is when person A and person B are upset at each other when the the actual target of their emotion could be something else. Or, you know, it's like, uh, I, I, I get mad at your parents, you know, my partner's parents. I'm choosing them as the safe target for the emotion because you, my actual target, are unsafe to me for me to, to choose you as the target because I would, I would see it deteriorate our relationship or whatever. So she's displacing right now. She's mad at herself. She's putting that onto Shin and saying, we could die tomorrow. Why, why isn't he spending time with me? Have you told him? Have you ever tried to talk to him about that? Have you ever shown him that affection? Or are you, is, is it a safer uh, psychological challenge to blame him for that? Because he's the leader, right? And he's choosing to talk to Lena instead of me. What you do with someone who is displacing like this, though, is, is you can't just tell them what they're doing. You have to have them understand what they're doing themselves. And you would ask them, you know, where does this anger come from, Kudena? Well, it's his fault. He's, you know, he's spending this time from him. Okay, but tell me about the anger. How are you experiencing it? When does it start? Well, it starts when I hear, when I see him talking to her. Okay, but why does that make you angry? Well, because it's unfair, right? I'm the one who spends so much time with him. He doesn't even know what she looks like. She doesn't care about him anyway. She's just like every other handler, right? Okay, so so anger is being expressed, definitely, but it sounds like, like what you're feeling is also rejection. Yes, I'm feeling rejected. Yeah, I'm feeling like he's totally ignoring me. Okay, so why does it hurt to be ignored? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, because I feel worthless. Okay, now we are actually talking about the real target. I feel worthless, right? Now we are engaged in discussing the real person that your psychological conflict is about, you. Why do you feel worthless? What does it mean to feel worthless? Well, it means that, you know, every day I could be spending with someone I love, but he doesn't even know that I love him. Okay, but 
have you spoken to him about it? No, I haven't. I just feel too afraid. Right now, now we are actually discussing the real issue. But you can't just go right there and say, oh, Karina, you're displacing. You're really mad at yourself. It cheapens the, the process to jump right there. And often that's, that's what therapy looks like, is you walk in and within five minutes, I often know what direction we need to go in. But if I tell you right away, we're, we're jumping the gun and we may be able to circle back around to it, but you need to be in the psychological arena first before we have that battle. I can't just come at you while you're in a different arena and say, hey, let's go deal with that fight over there. Cause you're here already. You're, you're already in this displaced issue. I have to guide you through that process to say, okay, let's put that fight on hold and guide you over to where the real uh, arena of this problem is. And it's often with yourself. So it's a tricky process. Yeah, you, you can't just tell them. This is why when you give advice to your friends and you spot something like this and you just tell them, it often doesn't work. And they just continue to have that problem, right? Because therapy is not advice giving. It's, uh, it's a lot more in depth than that. You have to guide that person to figuring out the problem for themselves and registering, oh, this is about me. Because then they participate in the revelation. If I just give you the revolution and say, this is about you, it doesn't work. They have to understand that themselves. This is why we have therapists, yeah. So we're getting something interesting here, which is this background of we know that a lot of handlers have ended up with psychological problems after talking to Undertaker, whether that's Shin or whoever his predecessor was. As I suspected by reading the lyrics of the opening, I, I think that I think that there was probably another family member who was in the Undertaker mech that died and uh Shin has sort of taken over and that he's he's in he's interacting with them in some weird way. He's hearing things from them, like a family member, maybe a, a parent or something. But they all have this idea that Shin breaks these people. That he's very active in that. He he. Why doesn't he just break her? Like he has a choice in that. But here are other characters telling him, "Look, he doesn't do this on purpose. He he. It's it's a passive activity." And and what I like about the presentation of that is we're getting two different perspectives. One from someone who is trying to regulate the emotions in the scene, and one who is dysregulating. Right, regulating being we're we're trying to come back to an emotional uh, balance. Whereas Karina is dysregulating. She's, she's either exploding or imploding uh, emotionally. And so who do we trust in a scene like this? Whose perspective can we go with? Well, I'm much more inclined to trust that the person regulating their emotions is more observant and doesn't have a bias about Shin breaking these people. What if they know about displacement but didn't think about it? Can you bring it up directly to speed it up? So there are times where I might tell them, I, I just won't start with it. I won't just be like, oh, you're displacing. Unless this, is a, unless this is a client that I've been working with for a very long time, and we've already done that process several times, I will just bring it up with them and say, hey, so-and-so, you're displacing again. Look at the way you're choosing this target instead of yourself. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I, I can see that now. I've done this before. I'm talking more about when you first engage someone with that subject and and there may be a time where it's appropriate if I feel like they're really onto it. If I see them, especially if I see them questioning it and they say like, oh, I don't know why I'm so mad at this person. Like, can you, can you tell me? I'll be like, well, here's sometimes what happens, right? And I'll explain displacement. But I won't tell them you are the real target, right? I won't give them that. I'll say, here's how displacement works. Now, who do you think the real target of your emotion is? Like, I'll still give it back to them. Even if I'm explaining, even if I'm doing exposition to them, I'm doing therapeutic exposition, I will still hand it back to them and say, who do you think you're displacing against? Because they need to participate in the revelation for it to mean something, right? A therapist is not the expert in this situation. You are the expert, but I have to, I can guide you towards that expertise. <laughs> 
気に食わないから真のそれで壊してくれってあいつに言えるごめんでもやっぱり許せない Yeah, what does she do? She balks away from the idea of just telling him. Couldn't you say that to him? No, she can't because she's displacing. You have no reason to hate her. She, you don't know anything about her. What you do is you hate yourself. And that's a sad place to be in because I just want to take Karina and, and talk to her through this problem and say, hey, let's work on your own self esteem and, and bolster you up. Not, not to talk to Shin, of course. That's,、uh, he's, he's reserved for, for Lena, for me. Um, <laughs> so, I don't, <laughs> I don't want her to, to end up with him, but I want her to feel better about herself for sure. And, and here is another reason why she has that bias, of course. I love that visual as well. They, they show the mural, which is this. The mural is this statue that we saw when Lena first walked into her place of work, right? This sort of like, you know, sword bearing maiden with the crown. But in their side of the world, it has its sword raised up, and it's like this triumphant sort of representation of freedom and.、Um, Positive ideology. On the 86 side, it's this oppressor, right? Like the sword is being plunged down, and they also have the, the mannequin of you know, their 86 person sitting right below that. Like they are, they are surrounded by their own sort of fiction about this, right? And, and they have genuine reason to, to see the 85 colonies as. Oppressors and you know, dictators and all of those things. But part of that is part of the fiction that I'm talking about is exactly what Karena is up against, where she's, she's unable to integrate the idea that, yes, as a collective, they may be awful, but as people, let's not dehumanize them the same way they dehumanize us, right? Let's not look at Structurally, what's wrong with them, and decide that all of them are are evil. When here I have someone like Lena trying to give me the evidence that that's not true, and I'm rejecting it. And I'm rejecting it because when I search in my memories to confirm my bias, I have this very punctual and painful feeling of they killed my parents and they dehumanize us, right? So it's very hard for her to integrate. Lena, as, as a rejection of that evidence. And what I love from the other character is it shows us that image again, which this is the image that Karena is sitting with. They are the oppressors. This is what they stand for. And he closes the window on it almost as if to say, Yes, that is true. The, the events you've experienced are true. But we need to. Change the way we think about this, too, right? We can close the, the chapter, we can close the perspective on that and, and make way for a new one. There is so much fucking happening in this show, and, and the visual language is so brilliant at giving us a bigger idea than what the characters are talking about. And just every single scene is so useful and, and deliberate in telling us that. It's just amazing. It's fucking amazing. And look at that. There's even a moment where he invites her over. But then he also kind of leans away. He, he, I come back to this idea that Shin is the most emotionally sensitive person in this cast, right? They, they see him as locked off, but he's not. He, he can tell what she's feeling and that it upsets her. And, and he has 
a conflict between like, look, I know she may be romantically interested in me. I'm not going to invite that because I don't want to get attached. And also I potentially love Lena, who is represented by this white bandana, which I, I return to every time I see it. I'm like, what's behind that bandana? <laughs> Besides it being a, a nice visual metaphor for his connection with Lena. So he knows, he knows what Corinne is feeling and he wants, he wants her to feel like he's still, you know, on her side and that he can be a good leader for her, but he doesn't want to invite the further romantic feelings. Probably not because he, he's not interested, but because they're too dangerous, right, to him. So he invites her over. He wants her to feel a part of this, but then he also leans away. It's just so good. It's just so good. Also, cat. とても風切れなかったよ。Oh, the dog is the robot? I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> That's great. What I'm also seeing is probably the characters here, they're starting to wear down this perspective that Lena is just like every other handler. And I think that they're more keen to let her into their world than they they have before with a lot of their other handlers and i think it's not just the fact that she is sweet and calming and engages with them very genuinely it's also they they probably are looking to shin and saying hey if he accepts her we can accept her because he's the one keeping our whole psychological paradigm intact right their whole hierarchy of needs is kept together by the fact that shin is letting his be in disrepair. But what they see from Shin is that maybe Lena can help him repair uh, his own pyramid. There's our sensitive boy. Oh my gosh, he's so romantic as well. I love him. Oh, and he's smiling as well. I also, this is the first time I'm able, to, I'm able to see what he's reading, which is all along the Western Front, which is interesting because I kind of thought this was like a completely uh, fictional world, but that's like a real book. So I don't know what to make of that. I mean, obviously it's a, you know, a, a war story. Yeah, so it's interesting to me that uh, they're using a real book as reference in a fictional world yeah i think it's just I, i'll just take that as symbolism and and a nice sort of hint at uh to the audience that he's um that like i said about lena he stays engaged in the trauma even when like he's not at war which is not good for his mental health however it is good to see him uh smiling the author mentioned in the afterword, the first novel, to not think too hard about references. Just wanted to include them. That makes sense. Well, 
人が少ないし場所も離れているし寝る頃には10日完成がかかるだから普段も星が綺麗でそれは間違いなくここでの暮らしのいいところだそうキルシブリューテ私たちを恨んでいますかそれはもちろん差別されるのは辛いし悔しい収容所での暮らしは辛かったし戦うのはいつまでも怖いよだからそれを私たちに押し付けて AT6 は人間じゃなくて家畜だから構わないとかいうような奴らのことはやっぱり好きになれないなでもけどあなたたちアルバの全員が全員悪人じゃないというのも分かっているんだ AT6 の全員が必ずしも善人ばかりじゃなかったのと同じように私は AT6 の中でも珍しい人種だったから収容所でも以前のタイでもいろいろあったよもちろん私だけじゃないだろうし同じようにアルバにもいい人がいるのはまあ私は会ったことがないけど仲間の何人かは知っているから分かってはいるんだだからアルバというだけで恨んだりしないそうだったのですかではその方々には感謝しないといけませんねハンドラーワンあなたに少し興味が湧いてきたですかでは私からも一つ聞いていいかな Man, the direction of this show is so good I, I feel like it's just there's so much going on here what we're getting is a lot of um we're getting exposition definitely about uh this character she's also telling us some of the backstory of what it's like to be on this uh side of the war and what it's like to have that be a part of a generational issue as well right we're being exposed to how a bias like this develops but the visual language is also distracting us from that right we're 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 being engaged with so much visual information that it doesn't feel like i'm just being told backstory right there's the card game going on there's the joker card that she has which has the reaper on it which obviously they you know they call a uh, shin reaper they call him shinigami and i believe there's probably some reference here to the joker arcana the fool depicts a youth walking joyfully into the world he's taking his first steps and he's exuberant joyful and excited he carries nothing with him except a small sack caring nothing for the possible dangers that lie in his path indeed he is soon to encounter the first of these possible dangers for if he takes just a step more he may topple over the cliff that he is reaching but this doesn't seem to concern him we're unsure whether he is just naive or simply unaware a dog at his heels barks at him in warning and if he does not become more aware of his surroundings soon he may never see all of the adventures that he dreams of encountering so so perhaps what we're getting here is the contrast right of of who of who shin likely very much is on his insides right his this longing to be a a sort of adventurous and normal person with with dreams of his own but he's compelled by his life circumstances to be something else which is to be a a child soldier and also to be the reaper you yo jo demo izen no tai demo iroiro atta yo atta yo wake janai daro shi onaji yo ni areba ni mo ii hito ga iru no wa ma watashi wa atta koto ga nai kedo nakama no nanin ka wa shitte iru kara wakatte wa irun da fio definitely doesn't like her yeah you dake de uranda ni shinai and she's left with the joker card as well there's something going on here I, again i don't i don't have like the clairvoyance to know every single visual metaphor but i look at this and i'm like this is intentional for some reason the show is doing something with this is not just random what they're doing with this visual information that little eye twitch as well like Man, there's the the fucking animation quality is off the charts. Handora wa. 
Right, yeah, like a big punch in on that card. But just for a frame. And the intercutting. Man, this show is... It does things to my brain that, that no other show is doing. Ah, it's it's and then it and then it denies you the point of the the scene right or not the point of the scene you're getting the point of the scene but it's denying you the conclusion in a way that keeps me very engaged i fucking love this show it's just too good <laughs> the writing is so effective Do they have to wear face masks in the library because it's so dusty that, like, because no one goes in there? Because this is all real history and the society is only informed by fake bullshit? <laughs> God damn. <laughs> この半月出撃回数は他の隊より多いのに戦車ゼロなんだから。すごいすごい。でもたまには顔の見える男との話を聞かせてみよう。私なんて大変よ。いやいやいてかさ。テオバルトさん、何とする一時の字。フンベルト
something more along the lines of, I don't feel like I'm doing justice to the conversation or to you. I'm not being fair to you because I'm, I'm not in control of my emotions right now. So I want to step away and come back to you when, when I'm ready. Right. And, and there, my priority is to give you respect. It's not to respond to my honest emotion, which is, I don't want to be around you right now. And, and so when Lena says I'm developing a relationship based on trust, I think that she, she also has to understand they're not going to be truthful with her all the time because they have some biases against her and her culture that they don't know what she looks like, but that they know she looks like one of them, you know, one of the people that they hate that has uh, subjugated them and tortured them. And, and so she's looking for the wrong thing if she's looking for trust, because the second they're not able to be emotionally honest with her, she's going to think that the communication is breaking down when it might not be. The real pursuit to develop a relationship and a bond with someone is respect. And, and respect does not always mean being truthful, because my emotional truth may hurt you right now. It may be the truth, but but my priority should not be that. It should be to to give you that that sense of um, understanding and respect. This is an insane show. This is an insane show. I just, I, I cannot stop myself at this point. Like when I, every fucking line they say, this is the only other show that's like this is uh, Butchie the Rock, where like every line of dialogue sends me in a, a whirlwind of uh, theory crushing and psychoanalysis. <laughs> Like she has a total distortion about what their relationship is like right now. It's not built on trust yet. I also love how they don't draw attention to the dustiness of this place. Like they're just letting us figure out that, yeah, uh, no one cares about natural history because the fake history is what's predominant in this culture. <laughs> これでまた力になれる。見えてない要求の出ていた補充物資の納入日についてなのですが。キャット。申し訳ないのですが、もう少しお待ちいただければ。Did yeah, that's why it likes him. <laughs> I love how the show intersects scenes, how it shows one perspective and then shows the other side leading up to the cut. It's brilliant. It's truly brilliant. It's an effective way of storytelling that, again, it trusts you and respects your intelligence to to give you one perspective to lead you down a path of um questions and thoughts about it and then to override that with a completely different side and have you challenge what you've just seen it's it's brilliant <笑>名前は何というのですか白人間と聞き一番。<笑> みんなその時の気分で好きなように適当に呼ぶもんだから最近そっち見て声かけりゃとりあえず寄ってくるよ<笑> 
なるほどあ,あのどうかしましたかネズミが出ただけですネズミえ犬も飼っているのですかこいつがまた珍しい犬でさ<laughs> I love this I fucking love this um the last time we saw Lena in this room was the first time that she interfaced with them like on the night that、uh, she took over the job and and she had her lights off well we saw her a couple of times through the window but the last scene that took place was we saw her interfacing with them on the first night after she took the new job and and she had all of her lights off just you know、uh, by her table there and and before that was like the opening scene where we saw her bedroom And I had commented on it being very minimalistic and like feeling like a presentation of how she kind of pushes off her, the sides of her that are very genuine and emotional into like very sequestered areas. Right? She has her plushies and her family photos, but they're, they're on the shelf. They're not like, they're not a part of the decor and it doesn't represent her whole life. Most of her life is this, like, kind of staged, nice, minimalistic、uh, portrait of, of someone that has the job that she has. And we finally get a scene that actually pulls back from that and shows us her living space in a very brightened sort of way. And, and that the plushies are actually starkly highlighted, like in the animation style, you know, in a way that.、Um, The rest of the scene isn't. you know, in, in animation, what you're often seeing is like background stuff that's very fixed, like these books, and then foreground stuff that can move, right? So, right now it's Lena, she can move、um, her bed and her pillows and the plushies, which either tells me that they're about to move for whatever reason, or it's just trying to draw my eyes to them. And just the fact that everything is brightened up like this and that the fake flower is gone. And that she's enjoying herself and that she's, she's interacting with people who she feels like she can show the side of herself to in a non restricted way. It, it tells us that she's changing and it tells us that she's, she's becoming more comfortable living in the narrative of like, you know, real Lena and, and Rain, Lena's real emotions than she ever has before. And that she's become very protective of this time and space. In her evening to tap into those things. Does this count as her rest time? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's still work, but she is allowing herself to spend some time being herself rather than always trying to cover it up. And, and the visual language of that, again, is just fucking way too good. It's just way too good, the show and, and everything it's doing. <laughs> These little jump cuts are great as well. Yeah, telling us how much time she's spending there and slightly changing the camera angle. It's just very effective animation as well. Like, we're, we're going to transition time, even though you know, the, the sunlight's not changing. We're going to tell you that by just changing the, you know, the angle of the character and、um, how often she's、uh, spent. At that table. カレバは私にこう言ったんです。俺たちはこの国で生まれて育った共和国民だ。国を守って戦うのは市民の義務で誇り、だから俺たちは戦うんだと。助けてくれたあの人のその言葉に、私たちは答えねばならないと考えます。
Hey yo. Seriously? <laughs> she got fucking called out. She got absolutely fucking called out. Virgins, good people. <laughs> people who have sex, uh, totally disillusioned and cynical. What a fucking statement. We talked a lot in the last episode about how someone's self-esteem is either reinforced in a negative or a positive way. And not just a sense of self-esteem, but am I a good person, right? Am I fit for what I'm doing? And and Lena's competence in the role is very high. She's a very good tactician. We know that already. But she runs up against the challenge now of am I fit for this or am I too good of a person to do this? And the people that she's fighting for are telling her straight up, like you're, you're not, you're not made for this because you're not not because of something you can train, like your skill set in tactic and tactics, but but as a person, your your character is flawed in a very positive way that makes you not able to do this. I think that's a lie. I think that she is the the right person for this. But they're so not used to that. And and that's what makes me question where this is coming from because their experience with handlers is the kind of person who quits on the job or, you know, gets broken by Shin. And and that's who they're talking about when they're like, You're not you need to be that kind of person. You need to be hard edged and cynical. You're not cut out for this. But they have no exposure to someone like Lena. They have no idea what she's capable of giving them when she delivers empathy instead of this rejection. I think this is their own paratoxic distortion about her coming into play. And I hope that she does not take that away from this, that, that she's not meant to do this. I think that this is their insecurity uh, reaching out towards her in a way that's very complicated because they're complimenting her, right? But they're also rejecting her. This is like someone, you know, telling you, you're too nice of a person and I'm going to ruin your life. So you should stay away from me, right? It's it's painful to hear that because you you care about that person and you see something else from your relationship. And holy shit, what they're telling her is exactly what the fuck I was saying a few minutes ago when I was like, sometimes what is your true emotion is not good for the conversation. They're telling her what is true to them. They're They're honest. And and they're they're giving her what is essentially the truth, right? Like you're not good for us. You're being too nice. You're going to get too attached to us. It's a very honest statement, but it's not respectful. Lena does not want trust or or honesty from them in this moment. She wants that sense of respect. Trust me that I can be who I am, a normal, morally balanced person, and still be a good tactician for you. Like, the thing I was talking about is literally coming into play. It's not appropriate to be honest in this situation. Trust is not built on honesty, it's built on respect. ポイント 4なら8に敵撃準備。了解です。アンダーテイカー。ガンスリンガー配置について
So they are actually listening to her now in a way that they kind of weren't willing to do before. Oh my god, this, the direction of this show is just so good. It's just that, just that little moment of of tension of are they going to trust me? Right. Again, this is not not when I say trust. I'm talking about that that understanding of of respect. Right. Will they listen to me? Will they give me the kind of respect that honors the fact that I can be a good person and be a good tactician for you? And them listening to her confirms that and and raises that sense of esteem. そこ<笑> What good is information if you don't use it? Hell yeah. <laughs> God damn, the show is just uh, so on point. I feel like she's also a lot more willing to rebel against the institutions now. I think in some ways, before Lena got wrapped up with the 86 and Undertaker and all of that in this way, like when she was, you know, the handler for a different squadron, she engaged with those ideas that they mocked her for in a very abstract way, right? They they mocked her because it's very idealistic and very virgin-like thinking, um, very innocent. She knows that those are her morals and her principles, but she wasn't able to engage with them in, in a concrete way in, in, with actual people that puts them to the test. And now that she's working with Undertaker's squad, they are, they are confirmed and reinforced and they're no longer just ideologies or theories about what is right. She is experiencing it day to day, the very cause she's fighting for and, and is developing a connection with those people that reinforces that. And so this draws her much closer to not only her her true, softer inner self, but also the kinds of behaviors that real Lena, the softer Lena, would pursue, which is caring less about the institutions. She's she's flourishing, basically. <laughs> I'm gonna mute this scene because the song is starting to play. Oh no. No. God damn. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, no. It's happened again. No. <laughs> Inappropriate bunk. 
何が残念あんたにしてみれば AT6 の1匹や2匹とは死のうが家に帰ったらすっかり忘れて夕食楽しめる程度の話だろうそりゃこっちだって暇だったからさあんたの自分だけは差別とかしません豚扱いしませんって勘違いの正常ごっこにどうでもいい時なら No, no, don't do this to her こっちはたった今仲間が死んだんだそういう時まであんたの偽善に付き合ってなんかいられないってそれくらいわかれよ偽善それとは何仲間が死んでも何とも思ってないとか思ってるああそうかもね僕たちはあんたみたいな高尚な人間様とは違う人間以下の豚だものねち違います私はそんな違う何が違うんだよ僕たちを戦場に放り出して兵器扱いして戦わせて自分だけ壁の中でぬくぬく高みの見物決め込んでそれを平気な顔で享受してる今のあんたのその状態が豚扱いしますじゃ AT6 って呼んだことはない呼んだことがないだけだよ僕たちが望んで戦ってるとでも思ってるのかあんたたちが閉じ込めて戦えって強制したらこの9年何百万人も死なせてるのかそれを止めるさあさあそもそもあんたスタッフです I, I can't get any more traumatized. Oh, my. How? How can this be? How can this even be a show? How can it be this good? Oh, my God. I, 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 I'm fucking, I'm livid. I'm livid at what I've just seen. This show has just hit me with such like fierce confidence in its writing and direction to build me up so deeply on this like idea that Lena's connection to them and to herself, the real self that she's trying to flourish into can be reinforced by her interactions with them. And, and remember, I talked about like, you know, one crack in that. And, and if you favor that narrative, you will destroy your sense of self. And here's something like this, someone who was validating what she was doing, telling her that, yes, you can be different. We won't assign prejudice to you in the same way that, you know, we have everyone else. To lose someone like that because she couldn't be a good enough tactician. She didn't get the map fast enough. She didn't ask them their name. She wasn't connecting well enough with them. If she buys into all of that, she is doomed to never try again. And, and that's what's so heartbreaking about this is I just see, I see this beautiful thing form or, or start to form with them. And then it's so swiftly and painfully unwound, right? Like it has tied up a fucking knot in me and in Lena when she's like literally clutching her chest. Like you can feel the tension of all of this psychodrama that she's going through absolutely tightened in a way that feels very difficult to uh, to untie now. Her sense of self is just destroyed and and I'm destroyed from watching it. Kasumi, you are so right. And I did not know when I went on that monologue about trust and communication that that was going to be essentially the like whole punctuation of the episode that that yes what what Theo is telling her is the truth it's true because he feels it right I return to this idea of um, phenomenology which is the idea that regardless of what's objective if you experienced it a certain way it is true to you right Regardless of whether the Republic is really as bad as it appears to the 86, if, if that's what they experience, if they experience that trauma and that rejection and that subjugation, it creates real emotions for them that cause real behaviors and real biases, right? 
So experience is law, and it doesn't matter what's objective in a, in a psychological sense, right? So what Theo is telling her is true from his perspective. It is his lived experience that she is all of the things she says she's not and that she represents everything she says she doesn't. But what this relationship is being founded on is not honesty and truth, and it shouldn't be. It, it should be a stronger sense of respect. That should be the pursuit because what Theo gave her was the truth, but it's not appropriate. What Lena is going to take away from this is a true feeling of failure and an inability to actually connect with these people. Because now she is wondering, am, am, I, am I wrong for telling them I'm different and, and that they can count on me? Should I be the person that Theo is telling me I should be, this detached person who doesn't care about the losses, that doesn't have to live this experience when they walk away from the computer? Do I need to be that? Do I need to be what you're telling me? Do I need to live the narrative that that's the only way to be to actually do this job? Or or can she wrestle with the idea that, no, the narrative that Lena is building about herself is justified? This is seriously deep shit, like psychological stuff, man. I, I can't believe it. This is blowing my mind. I'm traumatized. I need like, I need so many more filters of trauma over this. Is that even possible? Can we go deeper? I don't know. I don't know if it's possible to go any deeper into the trauma. Was it really forming? We can see here that they never trusted her. They just humored her. I don't know if I agree with that. I think that Theo definitely never trusted her. And he's the only one talking to her right now, right? I I think that there are other people in the 86 who, again, are going to give her chances to reinforce a positive narrative out of this, but she may now overlook them because she is focused on what reinforces the imposter syndrome. She's being reinforced by someone who is telling her, you are wrong. You are in the wrong position. You are not good at what you're doing, and you're not even a good person. She is very much at risk of favoring that storyline than a lot of the positive reinforcement she's already been given by the young lady who just passed and by Shin and by all of this connection. Like that's the, that's the power of healing and destruction of narrative is that, you know, if you're not psychologically sound and something like this happens, it's going to be reinforcing a very dangerous narrative. And she will now disclude all of the positive development she's had with them. She should take away from this that Theo's perspective is not all of their perspectives. Do not walk away with the prejudice that what he is telling you is what all of them think about you. Because you're going to favor a very negative narrative out of that. <sighs> My god. Karina also doesn't trust Lena. Not right now. Not right now, but but the way I look at this, I think that Karina and Lena actually have a very strong potential to trust each other and have a good relationship. Because that's dramatic writing. You know, you present to me something that's not working and make me curious and striving for that to improve. And effective writing gives you just enough of that, right? It gave me a solid two episodes of building up this complicated dynamic of trust and respect and making me strive and want for that to be maintained and then rip it away. You know, it gives me just enough to be hopeful and then destroys me and any chance I have at thinking it gets better. But now my yearning for healing in this show is even greater and, and that compels me to uh, want to continue it, right? The show... I, 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 yeah, I don't know what else to say, man. I, it's, it's breaking me. It's destroying me. No, we are not watching episode four. I will literally start crying. <laughs> Two hours per episode is such a crazy pace to go at this show. I appreciate you spending so much time with me becoming this person, this traumatized person. <laughs> You you guys you guys are are insane, man. You've also managed to get me through two episodes of a 
big brain show without developing without developing the brain rot, which is an achievement. Usually the brain rot sets in after one episode. <laughs> what do you mean you can't wait for me to get to the emotionally heavier episodes? Is that not this? Is this is this the light emotional stuff? I'm already fully traumatized. All three of my camera angles are trauma now. What? How am I? What the fuck? How am I supposed to live through this? This is the appetizer. This is the intro. Oh god. Well, I guess we're looking forward to to finding out truly what it means to become and recover from anime-induced trauma. <laughs> oh, God.